All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, let's, let me see if I can, can we get the lights down a little bit? I want to do a quick poll of the audience uh, so that we can frame the conversation to meet your needs. How many in the room are K through 12 educators? Good, about half of you. How many of you are tech developers of some shape or fashion? How many of you are in community outreach, community service of some other form? And how many of you are in the arena of policy, higher ed, government, et cetera? OK. Good, good. So we've got a good broad spectrum. Um, we are here to talk about hacking the STEM curriculum. Uh, and, and what seems to be in the zeitgeist these days, the questions of ethical responsibility uh, and technology, and especially as it applies to STEM. And uh, I am thrilled that we have with us two people who have been at this game uh, a, a long, a, a quite a while. So Mitchell, I want to start with you and have you tell us, sort of bring us up to the moment where we are. How long have you been at this and what sorts of work have you done through the Mozilla Foundation that we should all take note of? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, so Mozilla's been around since 1998, but spun out as an independent org in 2003, 2004. So we've always been a technology organization, but focused really explicitly on what's the experience and impact both on people and on the architecture of the system, the internet or the web, as we used to call it. <clears throat> So this question of technology and society, or how to build technical systems that have positive social results has, has always been at the core of Mozilla. And that's for 20 years, yeah? Yeah, which is a long time in internet time. Yes. Um, I joke that sometimes Mozilla is literally the oldest thing on the consumer internet, and, and I mean it literally because uh, the consumer internet started really with the World Wide Web, which started with browsers. So, so in a sense, we're ancient. Um, and in a sense, we're still really a freak in that we try to live in the technical market by building products and compete with the giants. But do that as a nonprofit, really focused on what's the social benefit, the public benefit, and how to build systems for people even when we're not spending money since you know, the commercial side of the world is very good at, at tuning for people spending money. Uh, and, and so just again, to come back to this topic, the question of building technology, moving really quickly these days, who and where and how do we think about its impact on society, and in particular, how do technologists get involved? Right? Because clearly technologists are involved in building, uh, that's for sure, how do we bring those voices into the discussion of what's possible and what's not, and then how do we enhance the education that our technologists have so they're better prepared and better partners in the social debate about what does technology do, are there any limits on it, if so, is it self-limitation by the technologists or the companies? Is there regulation? Like, it's important to have technical reality in that discussion and debate, and so immensely important that STEM education be enhanced to be not only the technical domain expertise, but some education, understanding, toolkits about how that applies to humanity or affects humanity. Joff, why don't you uh, tell us what brings you to this moment in time? Yes, yeah, so Omidyar Network is the venture philanthropy of Pierre and Pam Omidyar, and Pierre was the founder of eBay. So uh, Pierre has been and continues to be a deep believer in the power of technology to empower people around the world. Uh, to, you know, he likes to say uh, that talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. Right, and so with that mindset, we've made investments for the last, since 2004, roughly the same amount of time as Mozilla, um, in tech for good around the world to empower people in their democracies, to include people in the financial systems, to educate people at scale, all these sorts of things. Um, and through the course of making those investments, we've been deep believers in that sort of web 1.0 techno-optimism that tech can solve all of these problems 
not blindly believing that, but sort of really living that ethos uh, as our investment strategy, as our um, investments in nonprofits and civil society, et cetera. Turns out that you know, we missed in a lot of ways, the negative impacts of those technologies. And so for the last two or three years, we've been making investments now in thinking about how do we build more responsible technology and a system in the technology sector that uh, embraces its responsibility to the people, systems, societies that it impacts. So as we've gone about that work, we've thought about, OK, so how do we do this work of training the next generation of technologists? How do we ensure that they are not per perpetuating the same models, standards, behaviors, et cetera, that have brought us to this place of you know, really negative, sometimes unintended, sometimes intended uh, consequences of the technology systems and products that we've built. So before we get to uh, the, the, the gist of what you're proposing moving forward, what would you each say are the key lessons that you've learned over the, over the first several decades? Uh, what are these takeaways that are now informing where you say, okay, we need the correction. What things need to be corrected? Well, I'm going to start a little broader. What are the key takeaways? Okay. Because I, I do like to start and say, like, the internet is still an amazing thing, an amazing capability, and has like, positive attributes. And so today, when we're looking at problems, it's easy to forget how much we rely on it and how odd a thing it actually is, or at least how new a thing, the, the access to information and ability to find and collaborate. So one takeaway I, I would make is a networked world is radically different, but the set of capabilities that we have at our fingertips is quite amazing. <clears throat> Second takeaway would be some of the techno-optimism um, that the social, that the early social engineering was closely tied to the technical architecture of the internet. <clears throat> uh, because the internet, as, as the technical underpinnings of it are not highly centralized. And so it's a very unusual system that operates at global scale, but the architecture itself does not require centralization. Like if for those who were born back in the days of landline phones only, that's a highly centralized system. You know, your, your phone line goes to one place and it's all connected. So the early social engineering tried to duplicate much of that and it was actually very effective for a small group of people with shared goals. So all the, the underpinnings of the internet or that the internet society represents, so the internet engineering task force represents or that Mozilla tries to represent have social engineering in them that was very intentional about collaboration and problem solving and trying out new things and how you earn responsibility and respect. And that social engineering system was immensely successful. It's given us the internet of today, but it was successful for a homogenous group with shared goals. And so that kind of was the optimism of the early days. And the third takeaway is now we're in an era where half of humanity is online. So we're not a homogenous group at all. Mm -hmm. And we do not have shared goals. You know, our politics are different. Some groups can benefit because they're actually harming other groups. We're not sure, you know, what belief system, you know, we share. And so the social engineering piece was quite remarkable. You know, we use the word open <laughs> to capture a lot of it. And very effective and not adequate for today's setting with all of humanity and all of human nature. So, so are you saying that the, 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 the ways that the internet is currently functioning where you can find your niche and stick with that niche and live within that niche, that that in some ways is a, an outgrowth of the original design of the internet itself? Well, the original design of the internet is that you, we, we, the phrase is decision making at the edges, mm -hmm. which can translate into, you know, what can you as a human being do without having to go and ask permission from one big business, for example? 
Um, that, that design is that you, as the server trying to plug into the network or the human being making decisions, have a lot of autonomy. Mm -hmm. That is the design. Now, some people choose to use it, or many, all of us maybe, to, to stay within a bubble. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the solution to that isn't, well, everything should be centralized and we'll, some authority figure will tell you what you can access. The solution has to be the combination of learning to live with technology, changing technology, deeper education, um, and understanding how technology impacts humanity, while I hope retaining the positive benefits of open, many of which are another way of saying human freedom or liberty. Mm -hmm. I mean, today it feels sometimes like the trolls have all the freedom and the rest of us pay the price. So you have to fix that uh, and, and hope, though, that as democratic societies, we still maintain enough individual decision making to feel like we are you know, have, have the liberty that we've mm -hmm. been trying to build. You have, how do you respond to this, this, this <laughs> brief and, and, and uh, mind-blowing <laughs> history of the internet? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think that we've done a really good job of building a, a technology industry and technology products that created the thing we imagined we needed, right? We created in, sort of intentionally through uh, advances in the way we taught technologists, the way that these things would accelerate. We, we actually built exactly what we intended to build. Um, because, and we did that because the 20th century saw this rapid acceleration in this belief that in techno-solutionism, right? And built really strong silos between, let's say, you know, humanities and STEM. And we thought, okay, humanities will deal with people and STEM will deal with products and science and ne'er the twain shall meet. And so technologists were sort of empowered to go and build this thing without speaking across that divide. And we, as members of society, sort of empower them to just go and build that thing. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, you know, to your question about lessons learned, well, that didn't work out very well for us, right? Um, and bridging the, that divide turns out to be as important, if not more important, than just building the product, right? That being able to solve for uh, how those things are impacting people and, and foreseeing those consequences of if we build this, is it good for society, right? If we build a centralized or decentralized system, what is the impact of that decision, right? And, and there wasn't sort of a societal reckoning with that, with that fundamental question even, and now all the questions that stem from those decisions that were made. Hmm. Oh, oh, actually, if, if, if I could jump in there, um, I am less a believer we can answer those questions before. I actually think it's very hard to look mm -hmm. at a technology and figure out its consequences. Because yes, like the technologists have built the internet, but I can tell, I mean like 15 years ago, who imagined it? Like it, it's not that we intentionally knew what we were gonna get. So I, I think there's an asking of those questions, but more an ongoing social capacity and dialogue to address things as we see them mm -hmm. and develop. Like, I think it's important to ask those questions at the beginning, but if you have to answer them, I, I, I don't think we can move um, because who can predict consequences at, you know, at, at scale? But, but building all the capacity to say, oh, like this is a problem, have technologists involved with ethicists, with anthropologists, with neuroscientists. I mean, today, I, you know, I, I think there's a real question of whether some of the online experiences are just basically addictive. Yes. And whether they're triggering the same centers in the brain that other addictive or addictive behaviors do. Well, we should understand that. And, and, and that requires neuroscientists, but technologists and ethicists and anthropologists and sociologists, you know, you know all, all to be having some way to engage together. Yeah. No, I think we're saying the same thing, right? We're saying that that process of questioning needs to be built in from the beginning and all through, and then afterward as well, right? We need this constant process of re engaging with these questions and with these disciplines uh, in a way that has not been traditionally embraced, right? We have not brought philosophers and ethicists to the table uh, to have those conversations with technologists to say, has what you built 
and good for people? Would you change anything about that? How would you change it? So I, I want to play that out in just a moment, but you did raise the word questions, which reminds me, we <laughs> forgot to let you know we are taking both questions from Slido as well as uh, we'll do a, uh, some questions on the mic as well uh, towards, the end of the, uh, towards the end of the session. So if you do have questions, please enter them in Slido or hold them in your brain and stand in line to get on mic at the end of the session. Back to this, this question. Where were the philosophers? Where were the ethicists? Um, let's play out how that might work. If you could each think about um, one key thorny element of the internet experience as you know it right now, one thing you would most like to get into and start to rework a little bit by inviting those folks in the room, where would you start? Well, I probably gave away my uh, punchline uh, a moment ago. I would actually, I would love to see serious research continue and be funded and understood about what is what drives engagement in particular with social media? Right? Is it, you know, some of the UI designers, when I talk to them in the world, they're designing to make people happy. Mm -hmm. And it feels great to them because when people stay on their site and click and engage and forward things, they're happy. Uh, but there's also outrage and anger and fear and, you know, clicking and forwarding without reading and without reflection and without. Um, contemplation, and then you start to see the number of people who will say, well, I've spent so much time online, and then I stop, and I wonder, well, what did I do? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it is a lot like, it sounds a lot like playing the slot machines. And so this question of <clears throat> today, the artificial intelligence in the big platforms probably know more about each one of us and how we respond to stimuli than we do. Right, so, so I, like to me, these are really fundamental aspects about human agency, and if I'm living in a system in which the big players know how to cause me to react, whether it's to click or to buy, or like the Russians seem to have figured out how to get some set of people outraged to go out and protest, and then get another set of people outraged to go out and counter protest at the same event. Like that, that's a, like an ability to manipulate human behavior that I think we ought to be researching, understanding, building products that do things differently, training all of us, like what are the signals? Like every time you see a recommendation engine, man, you, you, know, you should be aware this is what's happening. Um, and, and to um, try to make some progress on how we as individual human beings regain some agency as the AIs and machine learning develop you know, even more. Yeah, I'm going to answer your question without answering it. Um, I'm not sure there's a, a problem that needs to be solved as much as it is the way that the technology products are all built in the first place. Which is all of them. Yeah, well, any product by and large today does not, I mean, it's not in a product requirement document, right, which is the design brief for a product. Find me a tech company that has in a PRD, you know, how will this impact people? Uh, negatively? Have you considered its impact on happiness, well-being, flourishing, democracy? Have you thought about whether it will impact truth? Have you thought about whether it might cause addiction and uh, mental hijacking? Have you thought about alternative business models and revenue models for how to monetize this? Those are just not questions that are built in the fundamental process of building tech in the first place. So until we sort of embed that mindset in the way we train technologists, that those questions should be asked and answered. All of these products, whether it's AI systems, machine learning systems, uh, social media platforms, anybody who deals with data, anybody who deals with uh, you know, health information, anything like that has the potential to be either weaponized, misused, have these downsides, et cetera. Right? So that's why we're focused so much on Number one, how do we embed those mindsets and behaviors into current technologists, as well as how do we train those behaviors and mindsets in the next generation of technologists? So how hopeful are you that you can embed that in the current generation, or do you think we need to start afresh? I'm, I, 
I'm personally, and I can only speak for myself, really hopeful. I mean, you know, so Mozilla and Omidyar Network collaborated on a project that we've called the Responsible Computer Science Challenge, which is a project that we are engaged in to award up to three and a half million dollars to undergraduate computer science faculty in the US to embed and integrate ethics in their core technical curriculum at the undergraduate level. So if you're taking, you know, Python, if you're learning Java, if you're learning, right, just uh, systems architecture generally, how do you not just have a single class on ethics, how do you not have a standalone module or a 15 minute conversation at some point in the class about this, but how do you actually embed that in the work of building an algorithm in the first place, right? And I think actually if we can do that, if that becomes normative for computer scientists and data scientists and all those folks who are pipeline into the industry, if that becomes normative for them to do that, I don't see why it can't be, why it wouldn't be possible for us to live in that future where those questions are embedded and where we're building technology products that are good for people. I, I, I am hopeful. Well, I'm of two minds. I, I think within the technology industry, there are many who have a deep, deep desire to build the positive things we've always dreamed of from the network and to address some of these problems. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's deep and broad. I think what typically happens though, individuals are great. I mean, the human species can rationalize anything to ourselves. Right? And so I think once you're in a certain setting with people you really like and it's your work team, I think it's hard to ask that team to look up and say, oh my gosh. The, what have oh, we wrought? Oh, oh, what have we wrought, yeah. and we're gonna change it, and like, we're not gonna be the gods of tech anymore, and you know, maybe you know, the money flow will stop. I mean, I, I think that's hard, and I, I, I'm not saying that as a condemnation of the individuals, just as human nature, I think that's tough. So I think the degree of self-reform of some of the companies that have kind of led the way so far, I, I think it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do see sets of employees now starting to raise issues, but <clears throat> the pipeline of talent into these companies is so enormous. Like, mm -hmm. they are the only place you can get the data you need to do the work you've trained your lifetime for. So, so I, I don't think self-regulation is gonna get us even with employees, uh, you know, more interested in these things in the current in the current setup. But it, 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 could I also go the other direction for yes. just a moment? Uh, just one question before you go the other okay. direction: Do you see the need for some kind of uh, regulatory authority then? Uh, if if you're saying that that um, human nature alone won't be able to put enough of a break on this uh, to plow forward without considering the full ramifications. While we start the education process, do you also see the need for some authority to help these sure. companies weigh in? Right, even Zuck has said, oh, regulation. It's just a question of what's good regulation. I mean, anything that's powerful, we regulate. Mm -hmm. We regulate automobiles. I mean, car manufacturers could make a ton more money if we didn't have safety criteria. You know, same thing with food. So, so we were talking uh, this weekend about the evolution of the auto industry as an example. Do you think we're at this point now where, uh, you know, uh, just like the auto industry started off kind of free for all and producing all kinds of crazy contraptions, and at some point we said, well, we need safety standards. Yeah. Do you think we're there? I don't know. The thing about the auto industry is very concrete. Yeah. Right. Like, um, and whereas here the consequences are are, are harder to know beforehand. Um, I, I think the idea that tech is all good, we we passed that. <laughs> you know, this period of the internet where anything that like technology did, and you know, this classic, do whatever you want, essentially run as fast as you can, and don't worry about any damage that you cause. Like I think, like, society has passed that what we haven't figured out what to do about it yet. Um, and I think that this education piece is a long-term solution. And I think, you know, the, the challenge is at the undergraduate level, 
I'm also, I think it's, um, from a very early age, I mean, you know, with, 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 with children, we spend, you know, the, the mixed, in some ways I think childhood learning might, might be the, one of the deep examples of how to proceed because with young children, there's so much learning of domain expertise and there's also the socialization process that goes on. And so that is like the mixture of domain learning and interacting with humans. And I, I wonder if there's something in that model of how you, you, know, you typically do both with young kids. Um, and you certainly have to teach them to share, you know, and all of these things, whether, whether there is something as, as, as that can be continued into, um, you know, action and result. Because tech is action, right? It's very obscure and the internet's very new and it's moving very quickly and so it seems really different, but it's some form of taking action and result and, and you know, as you go forward, continuing to evaluate the two of them. Well, the, You're giving me that look. I hope it made some but, sense. Yeah, I, I think I want to dig in. What, do you want to respond to that first? Well, I, I was just going to say that I think we've, we've done this before with other STEM disciplines, right? So tech feels like this big, crazy, unwieldy thing, and it is. And yet we figured out how to do this in physics. Right? We figured out that if physicists were going to apply their knowledge to the development of nuclear weapons, we were going to have norms against that Right, through the Union of Concerned Scientists work and the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and sort of general societal norms against the use of that scientific knowledge for application for you know, negative impacts on people. We, we figured this out in civil engineering. Right, You look at, um, there's actually a super cool uh, group in Canada called the Society of the Iron Ring. Um, and it's a ceremony where if you're a civil engineer in Canada, when you graduate with your degree, you're presented with an iron ring to wear on your drafting hand. And it's apocryphally made from the metal of a collapsed bridge. Right? And so you are meant to have, as you go about your work as a civil engineer, in mind, oh, I might actually harm people as I go about this work. Right? So we've solved this problem through education and through norms and through all these things before. I'm not, so I think good regulation, yes. We obviously also regulate nuclear weapons right? through Tr treaties and all sorts of other things, right? There are normative regulations necessary, and it has to interplay also with these other pieces that we as a society and educationally and otherwise agree upon. Neither one in isolation is going to be enough to solve this, right? So the STEM curriculum, the regulation, the tools and training that we provide current technologists, the worker's voice that we give to people to have themselves be heard on the products that are developing, you know, the conversations we have at the early childhood level, it's yes and to all of it from my perspective. So let's talk about the education part. We have about half of the audience who are in K through 12 education. I'm going to make an assumption that most of the uses of technology in educational settings for that K through 12 group will primarily be on the user end. More and more we're seeing kids learn coding and begin to understand coding processes. I'm going to make the assumption that most of the students that these folks will see will not be delving heavily, heavily into that coding realm in their K through 12 settings. So uh, let's start with the user side. How, do we, how and where do we begin to address this, uh, if you will, uh, questioning or skepticism about what's being delivered to kids via technology? It's a great question. Um, the first thing that came to mind when you asked that question was, you know, how do we teach foreign languages to kids, right? We don't teach a foreign language in isolation from the cultural milieu in which that language lives and breathes in the world, right? We try. We do it poorly. We, we, yeah. Sure. But, right, we, yes. we attempt to, if you're taking French, to learn about cultures in which French is spoken, right? And at the higher levels, even, you know, you go on a class trip to France or whatever those kinds of things are, right? We, we try to create proximity, empathy, 
cultural understanding, you know, all the sorts of things that surround that language experience. We don't do that with code, right? So you're sort of taught code in this silo, uh, this isolation as a technical skill without understanding its applications, right? So I don't know the answer because I am not an educator, right? Yeah. But it seems to me like there has to be an opportunity to figure out what are the experiences we want to build in for kids also as they're learning to code that attempts to do that same basic thing, which is build proximity and empathy in, with, in the experience of learning that skill. I probably will have the incomplete non-answer answer here a little bit because that, that's partly why the call for exploration. Um, but I, I, I'll say that I think there may be some learnings from those who work with young kids from watching them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and on the other side, there are learnings as we begin to learn what it's like to be a user of technology ourselves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or are we being um, manipulated or directed or guided? So you see there certainly are initiatives about what, when and where do you believe something? I mean, it used to be like if it's written down, like don't believe it, but people often do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's the questions as for all of us as users, what is our state of mind? Right, this this um, get into the bubble, get into the outrage, get into the flow moment, especially when it's directed towards how to get you to spend money, mm -hmm. uh, the business model. Right, like, as we learn as adults, like when to recognize it, when to step back, then there is an analogy for users at all ages. Like I, I, I won't say what they are because I'm, what's appropriate for a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, right. like that would be ridiculous for, for me to try and sit here and say. But the experience of the technology is guiding you uh, in domain uh, or the technology is moving your emotions, um, these are the kinds of things that uh, you know, adults pass on and then learn from kids in response. Mm -hmm. so. So, as as a educator myself, I often see the the conversation framed as a zero sum game. Uh, if we're going to invest more heavily in STEM, what needs to give way? Mm. Uh, I want you both to talk a little bit about how to do this in ways where we don't feel like we're giving up. Let's say the humanities, for the sake of investing more in. The, the, the STEM education that's going to give us our foothold in society, et cetera. How do we do it? Yeah, so I think the premise of your question uh, gives a nod to my answer, which is it, it can't be these things in opposition to one another or a zero-sum game, right? We need to reintegrate these things back together so that the STEM curriculum includes arts and humanities, and the humanities and arts curriculum includes science, technology, <laughs> engineering, and math, right? Those two things should actually be deeply integrated together. And that was the way we taught these disciplines, by the way, in the 19th century, right? If you went to elite institutions in the United States uh, as an undergraduate or otherwise, you needed to know Latin and Greek and physics and calculus, and these were all part and parcel of the things. And it wasn't that you would just go and become a physicist and you would learn calc without learning Latin and Greek, right? There was a sense that in order to be an educated person, you needed to do all of this. And so we make, we, we imagine that there is this trade-off, and now this gets to high-level education policy in the United States, but I, but I think that when we create that dichotomy that says arts or science, we are automatically in a position that says, well, we, we have to choose, as opposed to saying, wouldn't it be great if we could blend these things together? So that technologists have a route into the humanities, and humanities students have a deep understanding of technology, because that is the world we live in, right? where everyone needs a little bit of everything. 
Well, it's interesting in this what kind of enhanced STEM discussion. Uh, it is, I think, difficult to imagine something new and different. I mean, that, this is often true. Like we found that with something as basic as a, as a browser 20 years ago. You know, people couldn't imagine that it, it it could be better than the world they were living in. Or who could have imagined? You know, you could take social media, right? Until you see it, it's hard to imagine something different. So. Right now, we are, uh, you know, our, our, our patterns and what we understand are there's arts and humanities and there's science. And some educational systems have, you do both, mm -hmm. uh, less and less so. Certainly the 20th century was a century of increasing specialization and, you know, a degree of domain knowledge that is unbelievable. Right. right. You're like a well-educated high school student's understanding of STEM today is just astonishing for someone of my generation. Right? There's a lot to learn there. Astonishing, but lacking. Well, not in the domain expertise right. of, you know, X or Y or Z. Yes. Um, and so, uh, the again, the reason we're so interested in the challenge and how to teach, in this case, just ethics, is how to actually integrate the two. So when you are working on a sort of STEM topic, like what are the problem sets? What is the point? What's the actual goal of what you're trying to do? Um, and and in 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 many cases today, you know, research suggests it's it's very abstract and divorced from how it might impact the world. And then there's also research that says some set of students are really turned off by that. By the abstractness. Yes, like sure. that it has no meaning. Why do I care? You know, like some people learn programming because they love to make the machine do what they want. Mm -hmm. That's typically, well, I mean, it gets into gender stuff. But <laughs> then there's a bunch of people who are like, why do I want to program? Like, I don't, I don't care what the machine does. I want to see some, something in life that matters to me. So the the, oh, you've got arts and humanities, you have to do both. Like, that's tough. Like, I'm really sympathetic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to you, you want a, a good, strong STEM education, and now, my gosh, I have to do something else as well. But the integration of, um, in a way of, of, like, interdisciplinary education. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been, been learning that solving today's problems, very often you want diverse teams from different specialties or subspecialties with different perspectives and that team-generated solutions or problem-solving is, is more powerful than the last century taught us, mm -hmm. uh, that, that the perspective of like what's the point, what kind of impact does it have, what's the goal, why am I doing this, can be another aspect that isn't like, oh, now I have to learn two other subjects as well. But, but that is a, how do you teach STEM, why, is 100% of it all abstract domain knowledge? Do you motivate other people? Do you motivate creativity by having more relationship to the human part of the world? Like those are the areas to explore and see. Have either of you seen stellar examples of this at work across all levels? I mean, higher ed, K through 12, have you seen instances where folks are really getting at the heart of what you're talking about? Yes, so you know, I'll I'll name a couple of I think really impressive efforts on this front. So there's a program at Harvard, and yes, it is Harvard. So let's stipulate that that is a uniquely uh, situated institution. But they have a program called Embedded CS, where they are bringing philosophy TAs, graduate students, to undergraduate computer science classes to TA the discussions in their sections alongside a computer science um, undergraduate TA. So they are deeply integrating the conversation at the core technical level with philosophy graduate students, right? Um, you see a program like um, what they're doing at MIT. Again, these are a lot of elite institutions, but MIT has a, a new billion dollar initiative on human-centered human AI, uh, which is going to be exactly this set of questions, right? Which is how do you build AI systems that are uh, not just human-centered design, but humanity-centered design. Uh, you have programs that have emerged at everything from Bemidji State to the University of Utah to University of Texas Austin. I mean, you are seeing this emerge as a, as a serious area of interest and discipline, particularly at the undergraduate level. I would say that it is not yet 
not yet, to my knowledge, really pushed downward. There are some interesting initiatives. Um, there's a CS Ethics um, initiative in New York City um, in the, in the um, high school level for CS Ethics education. Um, and, but it hasn't really, I don't think, yet pushed below the undergraduate level. And yet at the undergraduate level, there's a million uh, flowers blooming on that front. Well, I'm going to go to the other extreme on a small, it's like a um, science enrichment program mm -hmm. in elementary school level, which is the integration of how does this make you feel? If you're using this technology in a group, what are the group dynamics like? Um, what did you learn from it? You know, that, those sorts of discussions integrated into the actual domain learning piece. So I'm not ready to say yet, like that's the model to right. be actually scaled. Maybe it's particular to the communities in which it started or not, but um, uh, kind, kind of the other end of the spectrum. It's yes. much more experiential and it's a much younger age group um, with the, uh, you know, active learning where you're up and about. So not exactly, you know, what you think of as, as a university setting, but right. um, some, some pretty creative things there. Sure, so some analysis of group dynamics, uh, interrelationships in the course of accomplishing work, work together in, in groups. Right, which is different than the core domain expertise of a STEM field. For like sure. I'd want to be clear that I understand, yes. like that is a real thing that takes time and attention, and yes. group dynamics are not relevant to a bunch of the underlying um, domain. Right. But, but a, like an education, is there's the learning of the domain and the expertise, and then there's what do you do with it, and how do you apply it? And mm -hmm. so some exploration of that in addition to, well, how do I get a job, mm -hmm. right? Which is going to be the first question for most people because we, like, <laughs> you only have so many days before you need employment, right? Sure. So uh, let me ask you both before we turn to audience questions. Uh, you both have tried to remain on the side of the good in this <laughs> for a while. Have you found any converts? Have you found any hardcore CS people who have come around and said, my God, what have we wrought? Who are working with you or are working elsewhere to, to begin to reshape the thinking that they themselves went down and now are seeing what it, what it turned out or what turned out from it? Yes. I, you know, I think that the, the tech lash has done its job um, in, causing, in causing that reckoning. Um, with technologists and with computer scientists. I mean, you, there are some, I, I won't name them because that would be strange in this context, but you know, there are some computer science faculty I know at large, well-endowed by technologists kinds of institutions um, who are now leading the charge on a lot of this work, um, who, are, who have recognized that the way they were teaching this or the way they were um, allowing their students to go off ill-equipped ultimately for the, the thing that they were imagining they were equipping their students to do, um, have changed their approach to doing that. And again, it gives me hope because I think that we are, we are seeing sort of a recalibration to that in, in education and in technology. And it's certainly not everyone. I mean, we have a lot of work to do, I would say, still on that front. Um, but there is definitely a recalibration happening. And we're at the beginning stages of it. Mm -hmm. We're not done. We're at probably year two or three of a 20-year project to move all of this. Uh, but again, I have hope. Hmm. Mitchell brought anyone over to your side? <laughs> well, you know, I, I will say that uh, one of the things that I think keeps Mozilla going in a pretty difficult, just competitive market product space is exactly that. Um, and certainly for me, when um, like pretty much all the technologists who come to Mozilla come for that reason, right? Because there's more money at Google, it's easier at Google, you know, like life is rich and fat. I mean, you work hard at these companies, but, but you're winning, right? Like, like, you know, you're the giant. Um, and I, I, I think there's a huge appetite for it 
Um, and, and there's the structural problem that if you want to do a bunch of things, particularly if it involves data analysis, there are very few places you can work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I'll just go back and say, I think there's a huge appetite and we're, we are starting to see, you know, more of it and like, just creating a little more diversity in the tech ecosystem. So you, you know, the, the STEM graduates or the, the practitioners have more choice and actually how you, how you exercise your craft um, would also be really, very valuable and very tricky, yeah. <laughs> right? And that's why we're in the market. We're a nonprofit. It's not like I want to compete with Google and Facebook. Like if you ask me, like, how do I want to spend my life? That's not it. <laughs> but but that's where we are because how else do you get an option? And it it hasn't been a big period of winning like for Mozilla. We have you know like look at the mobile ecosystem. You know we lost that. Um, and so, but the, what we continue to find is the appetite is there, the understanding is growing, but there are still like structural changes, really competition and choice, which we don't have right now, mm -hmm. uh, would mm -hmm. go a long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. All right, let us turn to questions. I've got some on Slido, but if you want to ask a question directly, please stand up and, and uh, step to the mic and we'll make sure we'll get a mix of the two. So the, uh, the first question, is ethics practical enough for this? There's no single agreed ethic. How do we stop ethics and tech being all talk and lead to meaningful change instead? How do we avoid getting r wrapped up in the ethical conundrum of defining ethics? <laughs> yeah, so we, we have used the term ethics a lot in this conversation. And at the same time, I find it wildly unhelpful to use the term ethics. Um, I prefer just about any, any term to ethics, whether you call that responsibility, accountability, transparency, right? There's, there's a huge number of terms we could probably use that are better than ethics because I think as soon as we use the word ethics, we imagine you know, deontological versus consequentialist approaches. Uh, let's take Kant apart and understand, right? And that's not ultimately, I think, helpful for this conversation. I think what we mean when we say ethics is, you know, how does this impact people? Mm -hmm. How does this impact communities? How does this impact society? And, it, and at that level of understanding, we can sort of unpack ethics as being about what is good, mm -hmm. right? And yes, that is definitely a relative question, right? What is good for people? Person A may not be good for person B, and we certainly have to hash that out. Um, but I think that uh, if we imagine tech being uh, a place where that conversation happens, then yes, it won't, it won't be all talk. Then we'll actually be building tech products that are good for people. You know, in the same way that sustainability right, uh, was for a long time, people were really worried that sustainability would become sort of, you know, uh, greenwashing for companies, right? But it turns out that companies can create a competitive advantage for themselves based on their sustainability, that there's a race to the top for, for doing that work, et cetera. And I believe that the tech industry could do the same thing, right, and that it's not gonna be all ethics washing, but actually, there's gonna be a competitive advantage for the companies that deal to build the most trust and that have the most transparency and accountability on their products in the same way that, you know, we were talking about the automobile industry before. Volvo staked out a great position for itself as the safest car on the market, mm -hmm. right, by its safety standards. And I think a tech company that solves that problem, Mozilla is doing a great job of that today, and I would love to see the race to the top for that. Um, I, I think it's in totally, totally possible, and then it won't be ethics washing. It'll be about how are we accountable to people. Well, I have a, maybe it's a contrarian kind of view. I don't think any of this is going to solve the problem alone. Because a good part of our society is organized to maximize financial return to a small set of people. That's the corporate model. Um, and there really are discussions about, boy, if I'm going to make a decision that isn't maximizing return to shareholders, am I doing my job as a board member? Right? It, so, so our corporate law structure somehow leads to that discussion. You know, the idea that you would have stakeholders where is tech good for people, that is not a stakeholder in 
what's the financial return to my shareholders? So we have the movement towards B corporations, which at least in your charter you can say, <laughs> maximizing financial return to my shareholders is part of what we're doing, and therefore as a board or your fiduciary duty, you are officially legally enabled to do those things. Like that seems kind of silly. You need a whole new kind of corporate structure to make that clear. Um, but but seems that we do. And so, you know, the motive of money and profit and power and um, go almost godlike status. You know, I followed Zuck at a couple big events and it is like following God, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, and, and the security detail will push you around because he needs it, right? Just this adulation of vast auditoriums full of people, like that is a lot of positive social reinforcement. And so I don't think that ethics training or humanities training, you know, of, of employees or, or all of us will undo money, power, prestige, and adulation. Like, that's a lot of motivation. So it, it's a little contrarian to say, I, I, I don't think that changing the educational structure alone does those things. But, like, you need a bunch of things. You need societies to look up and say, ah, oh, well, we want something different. Maybe the legal structures need to be different. Maybe, um, maybe certain business models are simply not acceptable. Uh, maybe X, maybe Y, and we all need a way to talk about it and to make those kinds of balances. Well, it's really profitable. People like it. I mean, nothing. You know, like, you know, if you're still using these products, like, why are you complaining? You must like it. You must think that the benefit is greater than the loss. So maybe it is good for you. Or there's unquestionably great things that have come out of the big platform companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just like capabilities we never dreamed of. So is that better than what they're doing? Like, what's the balance? And so what I think that this education is, is so that all of us as societies and citizens can engage better in this and that the technologists themselves or the STEM practitioners themselves can also engage with us as we, as we figure these things out. So that might not be the most hopeful <laughs> of the answers, but I'm just, I mean, maybe it's because I live in Silicon Valley, you know, where technology and money and power are like everywhere, um, that it's gonna take a lot to figure out does that get the most innovation and the best change fastest, or do we want something else? Hmm. How should teachers demonstrate the significance of self-reflection when using tech? How do we build that while exploring the pros of tech in the classroom? So there's an old tried and true method of doing this. It's uh, the case study. I think it's a really powerful tool actually for doing this, right? Self-reflection around real life examples of where this thing has happened before and where other people have dealt with this same set of questions, right? Um, tends to be a very powerful tool for doing this. And those case studies can be at, operate at any level, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can, you can take young kids through a case study and understand like, how did this make you feel? How do you think this made your friend feel, right? And that, and that self-reflection built into the products, I think Mitchell was talking about that earlier, um, and into the curriculum I think would be really powerful. Um, and we should not give up that tech can be a powerful positive force for good. We should not abandon that, right, in, in any of these conversations. And we should deeply believe that, and we should also at the same time wrestle with that self-reflective piece. This may be a little bit of a wimp out. I would say this is precisely why we're so interested in this challenge and in the experimentation phase. Mm -hmm. right? like I, I'm not a teacher, and I don't really feel enabled to tell teachers you know, how, how to demonstrate these things. Um, and I, and uh, encouraging the experimentation and publicizing what we learn and you know, finding resources to scale and then to give teachers a set of things to try out and see what works for them. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can actually first scale all this experimentation and learning and testing piece. And then, I don't know, I don't, maybe by next year, we'll have completed what phase one of the mm. challenge, which is again, only in the US and at the undergraduate level. Um, but, but maybe we'll have learned some things and mm -hmm. in the next year we'll have at least more to say on this mm -hmm. and, and coming back. Hmm. 
Mitchell, there's a question I think was written, in my mind it was written for you, uh, given your history. If there were more women in tech from the very get-go, would we be at this place today? Well, again, I'm a little contrarian. Okay. Uh, I am not so sure that the core human nature of women is different than the core human nature of men. Hmm. Like, I don't know. Okay. Right? Um, but I do know that, you know, stratification and making sure that you and yours have enough resources and caring for, you know, the people around you seems to be, uh, exist across genders. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, I, I just don't know. Um, I suppose if you said if it were more diverse, so there were yes, more. Yes, diverse at large, it, you sure. Right, like not just all women, but men and women and different cultures. I, I suspect we would. Hmm. I mean, the network is powerful. Just like, you know, fire is powerful and the printing press is powerful. And I can imagine when the printing press, you know, if we were all sitting there and looking at the printing press, we'd be saying, oh my gosh, any idea can now be printed and distributed to anyone. And you're not hearing it from your local, usually male authority figure, the priest or your father or whatever. So how are you going to know if it's true? Like someone could get this thing printed and not know anything and maybe they're going to believe it. Like, like the, the, I, so I think that the consequences of the printing press to the society of the time were probably as vast as we're looking at and as unclear. And almost immediately harnessed by a monastic community, which was by and large men. <laughs> so so yeah. perhaps there's a lesson learned there as well. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, I don't know. I just think that the power of acquisition and if, so I don't know. Like, if it, would it be less in, unequal? I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Hmm. But it certainly might not take the view that it is just okay and we can't do anything about the explosion of torture and death and rape threats and oh my God, we know IP addresses. We're looking at IP addresses of these guys coming in, but God forbid we should use them to help protect women. I mean, that might be different, and mm. that would be a big step forward. <laughs> Do you want me to answer it, too? Um, Please, yes. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Um, I think uh, there's no question that diversity in the building of products yields better outcomes. I think that has been demonstrated and, and agreed upon, right? Um, you know, if you're building a form for uh, people to input their name, mm -hmm. right, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, you, you see... Uh, you know, sometimes a, an answer will get kicked out if it's not as many as three characters. Well, it turns out if your last name is Lee or Hugh, uh, that's two characters, and, and you need someone in the room who says, actually, there are last names that are fewer than three characters to, in building that product, right? So whether it's women, underrepresented minorities, people from different life experiences, socioeconomic class, geographies, whatever that is, there's no question that we would have a different uh, set of products at our disposal if there were more diverse teams building them. And what I hear you say is not just uh, diversity in, ten, in, in terms of life experiences or, or origins, but also you're proposing diversity at the point of design. So it's not just the hardcore CS person in the room. You have the person who's got the ethical considerations. You have the person who's considering the user experience. You have you know, uh, this larger group of people fashioning something in conjunction and not just let's let the CS people take a crack at it first and then see what we got. Correct. Yeah. We are at a point where we need to wrap up. With that in mind, I have one last question for each of you. It is now almost 4.30 in the afternoon. Probably people are starting to say, wow, we've had a full day. I want you to give them one point of consideration or one point of action before they leave this afternoon. What is the one thing you hope they take away? Well, I, I, from my perspective, it, you know, this question of teaching what I call enhanced STEM, one of the questions was, is ethics really enough? And, and I'd say no, it's, 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 it's broader. Um, but it's not actually a given. So my point would be, you know, go take a poll of the four or five technologists or STEM practitioners you're closest with and see what their perspective is and um, whether they actually think, oh, no, STEM alone is enough 
and then you know for the next discussion, like how to move past that discussion. Don't trust that answer then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from my point of view, we are in need of a movement for this enhanced STEM approach, uh, for this deeply integrated approach. And so uh, I would answer the question as that everyone in this room can and should be an evangelist for this point of view to essentially do the same thing that Mitchell is talking about, but not only to then ask the question, but to promote the point of view that this is important and necessary in building the product and teaching in this way that you know, using the hashtag responsible tech or using the hashtag enhanced STEM and really pushing this point of view will instantiate the movement that we need that will carry us through this generation so that in 10 years, we will not be having this conversation anymore. Great, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you all. You've been a great audience. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon here on day one of South by EDU. <laughs>